morning shine, shine, shine. Las Vegas, shine your light on me. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight with your award-winning host, Dale Davidson. Dale interviews fascinating guests from top-ranked celebrities to people just like you who have an important story to tell. For more than 15 years, Dale is broadcast every week from the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. He finds the people who really make Las Vegas a one-of-a-kind city and lets the world know just what's happening in this remarkable town. You'll discover why 50 million people visit the entertainment capital of the world every year. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of Las Vegas Tonight. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. We're trying something a little bit new today. We have a terrific guest on hand, and both of us are on Zoom. So yeah. we've got a brand new technique, and uh, hopefully this will give us the opportunity to interview people during A, the pandemic, and B, elsewhere in the United States or around the world. And I'm very pleased to have one of my favorite guests. He's actually been on more than anyone, Pastor Michael Hatch, who is senior pastor of Balm of Gilead Global Ministries. He's my personal guru. And I go to Michael whenever I have a thorny question or a deep societal problem. And I got one today. Michael, thanks for coming back again. So well, appreciate it. Is, it is my pleasure, Dale. I love having fellowship with you, whether it's personal, whether it's Zoom, doesn't matter. Just <laughs> love being in fellowship with you, man. You you are an inspiration to all, especially myself. Oh, thank you. And yeah. you are you are an inspiration to all of us here in Las Vegas and a real um, mentor to the Christian community and to all the people in your church, sure. which has come an awful long way for being a new plant. Tell us a little bit about the latest with Balm of Gilead. Yes, well, our, our church is planted in what's called the Cambridge Community of Las Vegas. Cambridge Community has been the um, most dangerous zip code in Las Vegas for the last almost 30, 40 years. <clears throat> number one per capita murder, number one per capita rape, number one per capita robbery, burglary, um, uh, assault, aggravated assault, uh, sex trafficking, drug drug sales, um, gang violence, all of it. Incredible. And so never been a church there. So obviously nobody wanted to plant a church in that community because number one, the median income is $13,500. And we have a, um, a between 35 and 42% adult illiteracy rate. So that obviously is going to be prob problematic. And so God planted us there. We've been there five years. And like I said, 2019, uh, the murder rate went down 88%. We've we worked hard with Metro Police Department wow. as well as trying to, you know, um, uh, pass the community. The police were yeah. amazed and so yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, were, they were great. It was it was great. We worked together. So, yeah, so now the church has grown and we've had, we have a new sanctuary. And so, um, yes, we're, we're doing fairly well. God has blessed us uh, because, you know, my, my goal is to be fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. So we yeah. can and fish. For, for those that need to be saved. Yes, God has been good to us. Um, and are you still having uh, reading classes and, and or other classes at the church? Yeah, well, what happened was we, we got approved to do the GED, uh, do, do English as a second language. We haven't, we actually were starting next month. We were just about to start when the pandemic hit. Oh, okay. We got approved through, um, through Clark County School, School District, but we needed to um, make some changes and we did make the change and then COVID hit. And so now they changed the platform. We got to do it virtually. And so okay. we, we just were able to, we got some computers donated. We can do it right in the church. So we'll be starting that next month. We'll be starting the GED oh. as well as English of second language. We're doing a mental health clinic, addiction recovery clinic. Uh, we have another church, Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley moving in next door, not for the church, but, but for the outreach, help us do the after school program. We don't have the funds to, to hire um, staff for that. So they already have on people on staff and they believe in our vision. So they're coming in next door to help us out. So it's going to be great. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it fantastic? It's great. Congratulations on the well, success. Yes. We appreciate you and your church so much. Well, praise um, God. As I mentioned, you, you're my personal guru. And whenever I've got a, a thorny question, I turn to you and I've got one for you today. Okay. Um, we have talked in the past about the racial divide, uh, and we've talked other issues, uh, uh, the lack of fatherhood, and and uh, and its and its uh, 
connection to crime and juvenile delinquency and other important issues like that. And I want you to tackle uh, the biggest one facing the United States right now, uh, the divide politically, the divide between um, left and right, uh, the divide that has split families, in fact. Yes. Yeah, I worry about that some. And, and could you tell, could you give, a, give me your take on what's happening in the U.S. right now? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's one of the most divisive times in our history. Um, I, I look at the divide between left and right, and I, I have to say that this is probably the most polarized our nation has ever been. Um, when you look at the, you know, fundamental issues involved, well, I look back to uh, the 1960s during the Vietnam War. Our country was very, very polarized then. And the polarization was based on one issue, which was the Vietnam War. <clears throat> and you had, you had many that believed that America should not be in Vietnam because it was a, a, a useless war, <clears throat> along with the fact, coupled with the fact that we had 18, 19, 20-year-olds being drafted into the military. And we lost almost 59,000 uh, lives to that war that we yeah. eventually lost, if you really call it, we eventually lost the war. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, we had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire in protests. We had uh, people, college students, uh, being killed by our military. Uh, we had, I think it was four killed at Kent State, three killed at Berkeley, Jackson State. I mean, just because of the protests. So that was a really polarized time. But like I said, it was around one issue. Well, yes. now, now our government, left and right, is polarized over so many issues. There's there's, yes. there's there's abortion, you know. Left, pretty, it's all pretty much become almost a, a, a almost a Democrat Republican issue when it's really more liberal conservative. Because you have you have um, conservative Democrats, then you there have liberal some. Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not really just um, Republican Democrat. It's left versus right, conservative versus liberal. <laughs> and so now we have we have the abortion issue, we have the gay marriage issue. Uh, we have the fiscal policy issue. We have the policy on Israel, which really, really, really concerns me. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that concerns me very much. I yeah. think that concerns me probably more than others uh, yes. because of the fact that the scripture tells us whoever blesses Abraham will be blessed, whoever curses Abraham will be cursed. And America yes. has been uh, a successful um, superpower for a long time. But I believe that most of that has been because of our allegiance to Israel. And so when you start to turn your back on Israel, you start to turn your back on the blessings of God. And the scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation, sinners reproach to any people. So it, it, it becomes very problematic. But then you have the fiscal issues. You have, I mean, there's so many different issues that are, are, are pretty much down the left, right, conservative, liberal way that uh, it's causing, as you said, it's causing families to, to, to split. It's causing yeah. major disruptions in family structure and society as a whole. <clears throat> but I go even deeper than that when I look at it from even a black white issue or a, a racism issue. Yeah. Because I told you I was raised in, born and raised in Washington, D.C. And as I was born and raised, I was told that I'm always a Democrat. <clears throat> and so I believe that all blacks were Democrats until um, my first marriage. My father-in-law, he was in President Carter's cabinet. Uh, Junius Hayes IV, and he made a statement um, to me after I found out that he was a black Republican. And I said, Mr. Hayes, there's no such thing. That's an oxymoron. There's no such <laughs> thing as a black Republican. He said, Michael, my goal is simply to get the Democratic Party to stop taking the African-American vote for granted. And I thought that was profound, uh, because at that point, I began to look at the actual policies as opposed to just knowing as a black man that I'm a Democrat. And so what I found out is that I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I found out that I'm a conservative and I believe in conservative values. Uh, and some, some issues, I am liberal. Uh, there's some liberal parts of me when it comes to uh, fiscal policy, you know, uh, when it comes to um, certain issues pertaining to public health, uh, certain issues pertaining to public wellness um, and things of that nature. I may be a little more, not necessarily, maybe not liberal, maybe more progressive, middle of the road. But the idea is that so that there's there's a divide that many African Americans are still under the illusion that automatically Democrats, and so they don't even look at the don't even look at the uh, um, how someone's voting record has been. They don't look at the policies of that person. They just say if they're black, then if I'm black, I vote Democrat. And the idea is that we found people on both sides 
There are people that are also Republicans and have no idea why they're Republicans. They were told they're Republicans. And it just happens yeah. to be that it seems to be that it's more white than Republican and more black than a Democrat, when really if people just look at the issues, they might find themselves on the complete other side of the aisle when you just look at the issues. So it's been almost where um, the division in politics has become a division in race as well. So that kind of race has fed into the division in politics, where I believe one of the goals in order to come out of this is for people to begin to look at their own values, begin to look at what they value, and then line those values up with the voting record of the person they're going to vote for. And so now we're in a, we're in a major quandary uh, because, you know, here we are um, where the divide is so great, it's going to take some time to really work things out to get people to a place where they can actually uh, begin to respect someone's decision to vote the way that they vote. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, if you look at it biblically, uh, it's, it's almost as though uh, people are uh, worshiping idols uh, politically. I mean, yes. we have to vote for a person you know, for a senator, a man or a woman, for president, a man or a woman. Um, but we're not, I believe, supposed to idolize them. And I think that's been part of the issue and part of the reason January 6th, uh, 2021 happened uh, when there was a, a riot, certainly. I don't know if it was an insurrection, but it certainly was a riot at the U.S. Capitol. Um, what's your feeling about that, about the idol worship? Well, that's what I've, I've, I coined that uh, not long ago, <clears throat> that one of the things that um, as the believers, as, as people of God, uh, the scripture says that the government shall be on his shoulders, talking about Christ, that the government shall be on his shoulders. And so when we look at that, that means that we look to Christ uh, to be the ultimate judge, to be the ultimate governor, to be the ultimate president, if you will. Yes. And so what happens is sometimes, especially in the conservative camp, uh, whenever there's some relief uh, from some what we consider uh, wicked laws, wicked voting, um, right. you know, to, toward wicked plans and, and wicked um, agendas. And when that happens, you know, obviously we go to pray because we know those not, that's not God's will. So when we get someone in office, whether it's, whether it's mayor, whether it's governor, uh, whether it's Senate, whether it's Congress, whatever. And that person mm -hmm. seems to have conservative voting rights. And we just have conservative values. We follow that person, not realizing that it's God behind anybody who's doing whatever they're doing. And so what happens is people begin to let the guards down and begin to make those people their idols to where yes. they want that person in office so badly that they're willing to do anything to have that, even though it violates the principles they say they believe in, They'll do perform those acts in, in situations, circumstances that are totally against what they say they believe, which I yes. believe is what happened on January 6th, at least part of it. There, there was some some participation by other organizations that were, were you know, had bad intentions from the beginning. Antifa is one of them yeah. and a few other that, that kind of heard about the, the march. But they joined in and helped be part of the insurrection. But just in general, you know, uh, our former president, you know, he made some statements that, you know, probably could have been dealt with a little differently for sure. And it, sure. It, it, it ended in a way because people began to idolize the person as opposed to the God of the person. And so, yeah, it, it's an issue that has to be dealt with where the body of Christ has to come to recognize that the government is on Christ's shoulders. And just because we got a relief for some of the social programs, I mean, not social programs, some of the uh, moral issues in our government uh, doesn't mean that you stop praying and being an ally as a person that God sent to help. So yes. now it's the thing where now we got to go back to praying um, for uh, some of the issues that are causing division. Uh, they're going to cause even a greater division now uh, because some of the policies that are coming in are not necessarily those of those that believe conservative values. But it, it yes. doesn't matter. God tells us to pray for those that are in authority, period, yes. so that we can live peaceable lives. And so the idea that whether it's Democrat, Republican, whether it's somebody we agree with or don't agree with, God ultimately has the last say. And our, our trust has to be in God, not in the person. Yes, and, and he tells us to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Absolutely. And render unto God that which is God's. Yes. Um, we've got we've to take a really brief break. I've got a couple of more authority questions and awesome. issues for you to solve for our nation. Awesome. <laughs> I'll be back with Pastor Michael Hatch right after these messages. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Dale Davidson, host of Las Vegas Tonight. You know, radio has an enduring place in the heart of America. Sometimes it's music that can enliven your spirit or keep you company when you need some. More often for me, it's just been the right spoken word or two that can quiet my mind and soul. Radio brings me a reassuring word in the quiet of night or a welcoming voice early in the morning as I shake off the night's sleep and find my way into God's purpose for my day. And always, I find the best radio station is the one that brings me the best news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. My favorite radio station is KKVV in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's still right where it's been for years at 1060 on the AM dial, hovering over Sin City like a gospel airship, broadcasting the good news of the abounding love that Jesus Christ has for every single one of us. No matter who you are or where you live, you can receive God's word via the KKVV Gospel Airship. Just go to kkvv.com and click on Listen Live. KKVV is using all the tools that God's provided them, like podcasting and video streaming and video on demand to produce programs that lift up our fellow believers and save the lost. If you feel a calling to speak to others about Jesus Christ on your very own show, pick up the phone and call the station. They'll be happy to tell you how. Call KKVV today at 702-731-5588 or drop them an email at kkvvradio at hotmail.com. Please join me in becoming part of the KKVV family. You'll be glad you did. And welcome back to Las Vegas tonight. Uh, we have one of our very special friends, Pastor Michael Hatch of Balm of Gilead Global Ministries, a longtime successful business person, uh, I believe an intellectual, uh, and the, a guy who thinks about our society on a regular basis. So that's what we're talking about. Um, Michael, I've noticed lately that there have been a lot of crazy conspiracy theories, particularly on the internet, uh, where people are saying there's going to be martial law and, uh, and they're going to kick out the president and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And I want, you know, and I believe this is partially a result of this divide. Uh, people are in what, what I think of as echo chambers, only listening to people who agree with them. Right. And it just seems to get crazier and crazier. Uh, what's your what's your take on that? Well, it's interesting because I haven't heard all of them. I've heard a few of them. I even heard that. Um, I mean, just uh, let's go back to uh, the prophets that prophesied that Donald Trump was going to actually win the election. Yes. And so we found that that was um, was was you know some of the most well known prophets as well was yes. saying that he was going to win the election. And so, and then they say, oh, he's going to be uh, the president on um, on inauguration day, or right. he's going to be, the, he's, I mean, they were just talking crazy stuff that, yes. I mean, and that, that's, that's kind of set the tone for even more stuff, more, more craziness. Yes. And so I, I just don't, I personally don't buy, buy into those kind of things personally. And I believe, I think the key is what you said, Dale, that people, you know, they flock, birds of a feather flock together. And so anytime, I mean, you look at, you look at Jim Jones, you look at Heaven's Gate, you look at oh, yeah. David Koresh, you look at all these people that had actually very smart people following them. I mean, David yes. Koresh had doctors and lawyers and uh, accountants following them. I mean, just, just craziness. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where uh, you have to search your own soul to recognize the truth that you are uh, looking into and realize the, the unrealistic nature of some of the thoughts and processes that go through the minds of, of all human beings at times. Sure. Be careful about not allowing those things to overtake you to get it to where now you're in a place of deception where you can deceive your own self. Uh, there was one saying I heard was that the biggest fool we'd ever fool the fool is the fool that fooled himself. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I've I never mean, heard that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's it. The biggest fool we'd ever fool the fool is the fool that fooled himself. 
And that's yes. the problem because, you know, when you fall into those, those type of thought processes, it's because of something you've opened yourself up to. And so it's, it's something that has to be, is a concern uh, for those, because some people are just so enamored with these things that they're following uh, these folk that have these, these, um, these conspiracy theories to the point where they're giving money, they're giving their hearts to it. And it's a very, very dangerous place to be. Uh, the safest yes. place to be is in the truth of God's word and the truth even of what we see in society. And so you got, you got people that believe in uh, UFOs, some that don't believe in UFOs. Some people, have, you know, they have a, a cursory understanding of it. They don't go all over, but they don't travel around the world to see UFOs, but some do. And so this is thing you have to have a, a certain moderation in your soul to be able to recognize truth from something that's uh, not really, even in the, 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 the realm of orthodoxy. Sure, and, and this kind of goes back to something we, we talked about uh, before, and that is idolizing men you know, idolizing people, absolutely. you know, rather than Jesus Christ. And, and even if it doesn't bring you into, you know, some crazy theories, uh, it can, it can really disappoint you. You know, when you look at, at people like uh, Ravi Zacharias and what happened with, with him, you know, once he had passed away, um, the fact that he had been, he had been, uh, disloyal to his wife in a major way for years uh, probably drove some of his followers uh, away from Christianity. That's exactly right. And, and that worries me. You know, I, I've often heard that, that you don't want to convert to the converter. You want to convert <laughs> to Christ. That's exactly and, right. And this, is a, this is a problem, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it, you know, one of the things that, that, Paul said, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, now we, we know that God has set up, you know, spiritual leadership on the earth with human beings. However, the, 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 the ultimate understanding is this. All human beings are fallible. Every yes. human being is fallible. Yes, good now, point. Yeah, and, and with that, th there's that, that, that aspect of leadership that a good leader has to prepare its people for the fact that Men are fallible. Even, even myself, I tell the people in my church, if ever I should go astray from the doctrine of Christ, run out of the church. Yes. Run, run for your life. If you, if you hear me going crazy or you hear about, you know, uh, um, something that I'm doing that's outside of God's will, you know, is it cheating on the wife or, you know, doing just darnable heretical things? Uh, you, right. know, you, you have to recognize that I'm, I tell them all the time, I'm, I'm a human being. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm prone to failure. There, there can be failure. You know, obviously, you know, if we, if we want to be kept by the power of God through faith, we can be and God will keep us. And he has done that. But the idea is that you got to recognize that we follow God. We follow Christ. We follow God. We follow Christ. We follow God and we follow Christ. Yes. And anytime a human being deviates from that, <clears throat> you better find a way to follow Christ instead of that man. That man may be someone that was your spiritual mentor, your spiritual leader. And he means a lot to you, but he can't mean as much, that much to you where you follow him. Because the, the scripture says the blind follow the blind, they both fall into the ditch. And yes. we, don't, we don't want that to happen. And so the idea is you have to recognize that you have to find a way to follow Christ and recognize that man will be man. Yes, and very points very well taken. Um, what do you think it's going to take to heal this divide, to bring about understanding <clears throat> between friends, uh, between members of the same family. Um, what, what do you think will work both for Christians and for non-believers uh, to, to heal this split, which, which can really lead to serious consequences? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy answer. There's no easy answer. <laughs> but we have to look at something uh, that you and I have talked about historically um, that, that goes back to even the, um, the racial divide as well as the governmental divide, the yeah. left versus right, is that you look at big government, you look at small government, and you look at how historically there's been a big government push uh, in the African-American community at certain points in history. Uh, then there's been uh, pushes for small government by other more conservative um, genres of, of society, yes. recognizing that um, 
um, and I, I talked about you and I talked about this as well, um, in particular, how um, in 1980, Ronald Reagan uh, brought forth a, an agenda called Reaganomics. And then right. Reaganomics, basically what he did was he kicked everybody off of welfare. <clears throat> and as he kicked everyone off of welfare, he said, listen, there are able-bodied people that are on welfare and they don't realize that they're actually condemning their own soul from the perspective of that they keep themselves down, uh, their self-esteem stays low, their self-worth stays low, their self-image stays low uh, because they're, they're being uh, entitled. Um, yes. You know, and that entitlement really, especially being dependent upon the entitlement, you know, just for your basic sustenance is it, not, it's not a good thing for the human soul. No. So his thing was to kick everyone off welfare. And there was a lot of African-Americans that said, yeah, he doesn't like black people. So he's kicking us off welfare. No, no. There were more white people per capita than there were blacks. So more whites got to kick off welfare than blacks. But what yes. he did was really ingenious because what he did, he said, what I'm going to do is take the money that we save from those that should not be on welfare. And we're going to put it into education which include job training, things of that nature, uh, not just vocational training, not just college. Everybody's not meant yes. to go to college. Some, you know, will be vocationally trained, whether it be plumber, electrician, whatever the case may be. And what we found is that um, when he made that transfer, we had what's called the BEOG, the Basic Educational Opportunity Grant. More money was put in that than it's ever been in history. Uh, he put uh, the additional savings into SEOG, which is Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. That was at, the, at its highest point. He also put money in what's called the NDSL, the National Direct Student Loan, which had an interest rate of 2% even back in the, back in the 80s. Sure. And so, um, so that enabled many that have never gone to college, really first generation college in African-American community. You get out of that comes a Barack Obama, comes a, a um, Michelle Obama, becomes a um, Colin Powell, comes a Condoleezza Rice, uh, comes a Mike Tomlin, you know, comes those that are educated now and so the, the trajectory of their, their, their posterity and family is going to be on a greater trajectory because of the education level where they won't be in those, those places of poor um, dependency anymore. And so that was a major turning point. And so what has happened is that now um, we have to begin to, to, to go back to the fundamental issues that have been affecting society. And so now you have a more educated society from a certain perspective, especially in the, uh, the baby boomers. Now the, the millennials, they, they're going to college less, uh, but we're finding yes. more. We're starting to find more um, entrepreneurs in the um, in this generation in the the millennials, and so yes. now it's to trying to channel all of that into a place of of communal understanding, uh, where where we, we understand community, um, not just from a church perspective, but a community perspective that everybody's opinion counts, and that their opinion should not be judged because your opinion is different than theirs. So that yes. even goes back to when we look at with the, I have friends of mine that I tell, listen, I, I am totally against abortion. And so I'm, I'm more prone to vote for a conservative or conservative candidate. And I've had some of my close friends, you know, say some things that they, you know, I thought were really cross the line from a respect perspective, because yes. that was, was so, to them, it's just so black and white that they couldn't even see the other side of the coin, which has never really been that way other than Vietnam. Yes. And so now there has to be a place where, where respect is mutual respect for someone's opinion uh, has to be, you know, for paramount that I'm willing to respect their opinion. And, and even though I don't have the same opinion, I need to respect it and recognize that there's some, there's some things that have gone on in historical perspectives in the black camp, the white camp, the, the Hispanic camp that have affected where our minds are today. And those things have to be dealt with. And I think the problem is, is that not necessarily the problem, but part of the solution is that the body of Christ or the people of God have to demonstrate, have to show forth uh, the, the ideas of Christ's heart and the ideas of God's heart, which is number one, first and foremost, the greatest thing is love. Uh, there's faith, there's hope, oh, there's yes. love, but the yes, greatest of oh. these is love. Yes. So we have to be demonstrative of that love, being able to accept one another. And because the scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation, Sinners repose to any people. God is not expecting the incestuous farmer in the Midwest to be righteous. He's not expecting the gang member to be righteous. He's not expecting the pimp or the prostitute to be righteous. He's expecting his church to be righteous. So when he has a righteous church, then he can move, move forward the agenda even into the nation. And so as, as we begin to let that happen and begin to take our influence as the people of God into the secular society, because we, 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 live, we live in two worlds. Uh, we, 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 we're at Christ 
in culture, Christ above culture, and Christ transcender of culture. And so we have to be the same and that we have a message of truth that transcends culture and is always above culture, but we have to operate within the culture in order to be effective to change culture. And that, that comes about by walking in the truth and causing those that we touch, whether it be at work, whether it be at play, whether it be at the gym, wherever we go, that we take that message and, and we actually live that message out to be able to touch a society uh, that is based in secular principle. And I think when that happens, uh, we can begin to start making the change. And uh, because ultimately, those that are not believers in Christ, those that don't have a, a religious, like when I say religious, like I'm talking from a spiritual perspective, religion yes. and spirituality, uh, where they can let that trump their own emotions. Because a lot of times the emotions dictate the life as opposed to the principles of God dictating the life. And allowing that to take place in, in the workplace, in the marketplace, and in that particular perspective, we can begin to see change. But other than that, I don't think there is change. Now, obviously, government is going to be government. But that's why we as believers pray for government, so that government um, can respond, will respond to the hand of God, because the scripture says that the king's heart is in God's hand, and he turned it with us whatever way that he will. That no matter what the king thinks he's going to do, God has the last say. And so with that, you get some that say, well, what about evil? Well, you know, God doesn't tempt with evil. Evil comes from yes. the heart of man and from Satan. And so the idea that, that our presence on the earth is that which is going to bring salt and light and, and cause there to be a, a change that will affect society. It may take generations, but we got to start somewhere. Yeah, that is very well said, Michael. Um, and I was going to mention emotion as well. And yes. when you brought it up, I think that's a profound point. If we can pull back our emotional reactions oh, to God. people's, that could mean all the difference in the world. And part of the part of the problem, I think, is in social media, uh, we we can't see the person. We, there is no there is no uh, negative consequence uh, based on what we say to them. Uh, it it really opens people up to saying some pretty ugly things to one another. Yep. And that is something uh, that obviously Christ doesn't want in his church. No, it, it's social media is, uh, it can be absolutely magnificent or it can be absolutely evil. And, and I think yeah. that social media is almost like a, like a loaded 357 magnet. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's like, the truth. Yeah, if totally. you know how to use it, it's good. If you don't, yeah. if you use it for the wrong purposes, it can be devastating. And yes, so there, there I, I, about four years ago, there was a young, beautiful young lady. Uh, I think she was 15 years old that committed suicide because of the fact that people were, were talking bad about her on, on social media. Yeah, we're social bullying her. led her yeah. to suicide. Yeah. So, it's yeah. crazy. It's it crazy. Is crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're going to need to take another brief break, Michael. Uh, Pastor Michael Hatch is our very special guest. We'll be back with more right after these messages.
And welcome back to Las Vegas tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. We are so pleased, so happy to have Pastor Michael Hatch with us today. Uh, he's had some profound things to say about society, and we're going to make him say even more. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. Always a pleasure, Dale. I told you all, I love when the opportunity comes to be with you. Yeah, we were, we were talking during the break uh, about uh, this pandemic, and I was, you know, relating uh, some of what happened to me, yes. including almost a month in the hospital, and, uh, and people not believing uh, that it was real. And, you know, I think you can believe that politically uh, the crisis was used by people, but, you know, that could be. But as a disease, it's the real deal. And uh, I'm really sorry to see what what happened with people who believe some of the some of the conspiracy theories about COVID-19. It's really sad. <clears throat> I, I, I consider it disrespectful when someone, yeah. you know, uh, has has believed a conspiracy theory that is not real or not important or not even a uh, true uh, because you have families that have lost family members, have lost loved ones yes. to COVID nineteen, and and so to 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 play the game of you know conspiracy and it's not even real to me is just absolutely disrespectful to those that have lost family members to it. Oh yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's sad because it's a Very real, it's 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 um it's it's a real thing. I mean, as I told you, we, we lost our keyboard player. Unfortunately, um, our keyboard player believed that it wasn't real and cost him his life. Yeah, <laughs> and, and crazy. So it's it's serious. Let's talk about uh, end times for a minute, if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, some people, including including relatives of mine that have been uh, agnostic or even atheist, uh, that I pray for every every night, uh, have shown some interest in Christianity lately because of COVID nineteen. Right. and other things surrounding the pandemic. And they're asking me questions about signs of the end times, right. which I see as a, as a really positive thing uh, in the sense that, well, now they're having a look at Christ. Yes. You know, they're having a look at Christianity because they're seeing some things happen. Um, whether, so whether you're looking at, at uh, uh, the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation or you're following somebody who is who is truly a prophet. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about end times, more than usual. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on the interest that people have in uh, what's going to happen during the end times? Now, well, I think it's an open door for those that are believers. The evangelistic movement it's a it's a wide open door <clears throat> that should be taken advantage of. When I say that, God sets the stage uh, for the opportunity to get an audience. Yes. So what, what, what better opportunity for the audience now? And because people are truly, truly concerned about, you know, their future. They're concerned about, you know, um, the end time. They're concerned about eschatology. You know, they're, they're concerned about where we sit in an eschatological pers perspective now. And so yeah. it's, 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 I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, because when you think about it, you look through the scripture all throughout. And I, I like first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, because the people in Thessalonians, Thessalonica were actually believing that Christ was coming back during their time. Yes, so, yes, during this generation. They, yeah, they yeah, they, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They were, they, to the point they stopped working, you know, and, and Paul had to tell them, listen, if a man don't work, he don't eat. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they were waiting for the return of Christ. Uh, but the idea is that whether or not and Christ is coming back and whether or not the, uh, the return of Christ is soon, which I don't necessarily believe it is, that's not necessarily um, a thing to uh, to discount because of the fact that if, if people are concerned about it, God has set the stage. And the ultimate goal is that their lives be saved because ultimately it really doesn't matter <laughs> when Christ comes back. It's when you die. Because when you yes. die, Christ is coming back. In other words, the point is yes. that your life is now over and judgment will begin based on where you died, how you were, what your situation was when you died. As you die, so you rise. So yes. if, you, if you died a Christian, you rise in eternity. If you died a liar, you rise a liar. If you died a murderer, you rise a murderer. And so we know that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the goal is that to make sure I'm right with God, period. And so I think this is an opportunity 
uh, for the evangelical community and just you know, the body of Christ as a whole uh, to become more evangelistic. Because there are people that are genuinely extremely concerned about what's going to happen. But I would, I would make it more plain to think about it from this perspective, that your life is what really matters. Your life, your personal individual life is what matters. And where are you in relation uh, to your eternal destiny? How is your life related to what we know is going to happen as the scripture tells us uh, that at the end, there will be a time of judgment. And so the idea is that there's two resurrections. And so uh, the second resurrection is not going to be a pretty thing. And so I always tell people when you, when, uh, cause you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but when that time comes and you wake up, cause we're going to wake up to judgment. You better ask one question, which resurrection is this? And they say it's the first resurrection. Praise God, you're good. Yes. They said no. We got time. Yeah, you're good. Yes. But they say the second resurrection. They say, oh no, the first resurrection took place a thousand years ago. No, the millennial yes. reign started a thousand years ago. Yes. And this is the second resurrection. You got a problem. So, so yes. the idea is that we want to make sure that we lead them into the truth. Now, um, we talk about eschatology. However, eschatology uh, is relative to where your life is now. Because yes. your eschatological, eschatological situation or perspective is determinant upon where you are at the point of your death. And so the idea that you need to be right with God now, because none of us put on our calendar, I'll be dead next Tuesday at two o'clock. No one puts <laughs> death on their planner. They don't put it in because we don't know when it's going to happen. So it's, it's not a time to play with it. It's a time to really uh, uh, buckle down the hatches and recognize that my life has to be right with God. Now, do do members of your church uh, talk to you about the day of judgment, and yes. do they do they truly believe in that? And and uh, how plain do you make it to them? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I I talk, I talk about it all the time, and I hear I have have questions about it all the time, and mainly from the new believers. I mean, really? We have a lot of new believers that okay. that have yeah. believed in Christ for the very first time. I'm telling you. Yeah, we baptize people that have been never been baptized in their life, and they're baptized in their 40s, uh, 40, right. 45, 50 years old, being baptized for the first time. And one of the main questions we get that this blows me away here in America, I've had people ask me, say, you mean to tell me Jesus' mother was a virgin? And they didn't know that. Brand new. Brand new and news. In their 40s yeah. and 30s. I mean, yeah. it just boggles my mind that in America, I thought everybody had heard of Jesus you know, or that he knew that Mary was a virgin. But so we, I get that a lot from people that are new and they want yes. to know about what, what happens in the end time. And I tell them, you know, it's, you have to be right with Christ in your daily life uh, because there is a day of judgment. <clears throat> now, obviously um, I, I am a, 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 I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture I, I, because there's actually no scriptures in the Bible that support a pre-tribulation rapture. Yes, um, I, I know, yeah. Yeah, there's no, so script, my, my thing is that, uh, so the church will go through the tribulation. Uh, and, and we have, I mean, Matthew 20, 24 is so clear when it says he's coming after the tribulation, he tells it to us so yeah, clearly so, after yeah. those days. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that, you know, personally, I don't necessarily believe that uh, we as in this um, current age, 2021, would necessarily uh, see the end of the age because, uh um, the second coming because, first of all, the Antichrist has not been revealed. Number two, there's no temple in Jerusalem. Because remember, the Antichrist has to sit in the temple. That's right. There, yeah. there is no temple. Yeah. Along with the fact that the Temple Mount um, is, I mean, that there's still the Dome of the Rock Mosque is on the Temple on the temple Mount now. And yes. surely God's temple is not going to share the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock. I, I can't imagine that. So yes. there's so many signs that look to, to, toward that perspective. Uh, but the goal is to realize that, yes, uh, there is a second coming. Yes, there is a day of judgment. And I show them the scriptures to prove it. And so um, we even talk about Lazarus and the rich man, you know, from the just oh, perspective yeah. of, yeah. you know, of, of what torment is going to look like. And there's a lot of controversy around that passage over the ages. That, uh, commentators and theologians have, have had different kind of controversy about it. But th there's something to be said about that passage. So, yeah, it's, it's a real thing. And we have to be concerned about that in our daily life uh, because, you know, there's someone listening to a guy on the radio yesterday and he was talking about, well, there's so many options. There's so many options. Every option is just as viable as any other option. 
And it's like, wow, what deception. You know, no, no, there's really only one option. <laughs> you know, there's really only one option. And that is to believe that Christ was raised from the dead and that there is an eternity that you will have to either pay for your sins or be uh, in damnation or either be made right with God and be at peace and joy with him for the remainder of eternity. So, yes, it's a real thing and you have to be considered. Well, and I'm, and I'm glad uh, I feel the same way, Michael. I'm glad that people are once again, or for the first time, thinking about these things. Yes. And if there, I, if there was a, a good thing to the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, it would give, it, it would be that, you know, that yes. we've had the opportunity uh, as people all over the world uh, to sit and think about the future, to yes. think about our individual future and whether or not we're going to be in heaven uh, with our Lord and Savior. So I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that people will, as time goes on, come to Christ because of this experience. Don't well, you? I, I, I am totally with you, Dale, on that. In particular, I was talking to my old, my, uh, my, uh, my mentor, um, yeah. my father in the gospel just yesterday. And we, we were just simply talking about how God is speaking through the pandemic. God yeah. is speaking. The pan, God, the pandemic didn't catch God unawares. It yes. wasn't like God said, oh, wow, I'm so sorry, y'all. I, I let this one get by. <laughs> no, no, he's actually yeah. speaking through it. Uh, because, Dale, there's other things coming. Yes. There's, other, there's levels of persecution that the body of Christ in America has never experienced that's yes. coming our way. Yes. And you can see the signs. And so we're not prepared. And so I believe this pandemic is part of the preparation uh, for what is coming. Uh, I've, I've, I've felt that for a long time. And I'm, I'm sensing uh, that, that God is, is dealing with his church in particular. Because if you think about what the scripture says, it says, if judges begin at the household of God, where shall the sinner and the ungodly man be? And so ultimately, uh, there's something coming that we have to be prepared for. And God trying to clear his church up to make us right so that when people come running in, because of the, the persecution and because of the things that happen in our nation, they'll come to a church that's holy and separated unto him. Yeah, I believe that too. Wow. Um, speaking of new believers, uh, I'd like to ask you a favor, if you don't mind, sure. uh, to continue to, to look in your camera there and, and use the next three minutes or so uh, to talk to people about Christ and uh, to bring them to Christ. If, if, uh, that's on your heart, um, well, yeah. because I believe more than anything, that's the purpose of this show. So yeah. I'll uh, I'll pray with you if that's what you're going to do. Yeah, well, ultimately, <clears throat> that's why I love being on your show so much, Dale, is that I, I know that the ultimate goal is to lead people to the truth. It, Thank it's you. the truth. You want, we want people to know the truth. Jesus said it like this, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <laughs> and that freedom, that freedom he's talking about, it's not a freedom to do whatever you want, but it's a freedom to do what's right. It's, it's freedom to do the right thing. Freedom, in a, from a spiritual perspective, does not mean that I'm free to do whatever I want to do anytime I want to do it. Because if that was the case, then we would recognize that if someone makes a bad choice and does something that brings them into bondage, it proves they were never free at all. Because freedom is only the freedom to choose the right thing. It's not the freedom to choose anything you want. It's only yes. the freedom to choose what is right. Because if you choose what is wrong, it shows you're still in bondage. And see, ultimately, the goal is to be broken out of bondage. <clears throat> bondage, prison in the mind, prison in the spirit, uh, being bound to things that are no good for you. I mean, when I came to Christ, I was, I was an alcoholic, a complete alcoholic that did crack from time to time. You know, I was involved in um, the Panamanian Mafia on, on the East Coast. I was involved in all kinds of just darndable things that, uh, that I was bound by, bound by alcohol, bound by drugs, bound by violence, bound by a bad mouth, bound by bad alcohol, bound by anger. <laughs> and ultimately, I didn't know, I had no hope of being set free until sitting on my bed bunk, uh, facing 12 to 70 years in first season, five to 25 years in prison. And secondly, five to 20, 12 to 70 years in prison, God visited me both times. And in that, he gave me hope that there was a future. And what he did was I was supposed to get somewhere between 12 to 70 years in prison. And God, in his just love, mercy, and grace, caused the judge. And I talk about the king's heart being in God's hand. 
I was supposed to get a mandatory sentence, but this judge sentenced me to probation. Wow. He sentenced me to probation. Wow. And when he kicked everybody out of the courtroom, the only people in the courtroom was the judge, the bailiff, the court reporter, my attorney, and the district attorney. And Mr. Wow. Hatch, I normally commit people to prison to do what you did. He said, but I'm going to send you to three years in prison. And I was like, oh, God. And he said, and I suspended it all for probation. So I know that God's power is available uh, to those hearts that really want him. Because I said, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll serve you. And I've served him ever since. And so yes, the goal sir, is that, yeah. that God wants to set you free from whatever bondage it is. Sometimes I'm bound by things that I'm doing things I don't even like, uh, things I don't even like anymore. Because I know I don't like the effects of what I do. But I do it because it's become a habit. But when Jesus said, I come to set you free. And who the son sets free is free indeed. And so he wants us to have freedom uh, in spirit, freedom in our souls, and freedom even from the things that bind the flesh. And the only thing that can do that, that can make us free, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. His blood is powerful. It yeah, can deliver yeah, from yeah. any situation, any circumstance. I know people that have had mental health issues. They've had schizophrenia, 16 different personalities, had depression, <clears throat> had multiple personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and have been set free completely. No more medication because they trusted in Christ and Christ gave them their freedom even to be able to think right. And so yes. today I'm, I'm, I'm offering to you Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so God is drawing somebody's heart today. He's dealing with your heart about making a change. And you got to recognize you cannot make the change on your own. You don't have the strength. Uh, we're fighting against our own nature. We're fighting against a, a repetition in our spirits of doing the same thing over and over again, which has become a habit. And then we're fighting against Satan. So we have three, we have three enemies. We have the world, we have the flesh, and we have the devil fighting against us. And there's not enough human willpower ever to ever overcome those things. But Jesus said that I've overcome the world. This is the faith that overcomes the world, even your faith. Once you become to come to faith in Christ, it gives you the victory to overcome all three of those enemies so that you can live the rest of your life in peace and joy with Christ. I gave up a business that was very, very successful in order to pastor God's people. I left a lot of money on the table. But you know what? Even though I don't have the money I used to have, I have a peace that passes all understanding. And if I could go back to making money, I wouldn't now. Because what I have in Christ is not, it's, you can't even value it in money. There's no value. So the idea is that life has become worth living. Jesus gave us a promise. He said, I came to give you life, but not just life, but a life more abundant, or an abundant life, a life worth living. And that life, and the Greek word for that word life is zoe, which means the life of God. That now we can live the life that God lives as it was manifested by Jesus Christ. And so today is your opportunity uh, to say, you know what? I'm going to put down the crack pipe. I'm going to put down the alcohol. I'm going to put down everything. I'm going to even put down my anger because I want to live in peace with Christ. And so he's offering to you a peace today, a life today that's worth living. And then not only that, but after this life is over, we have a promise of eternal life with him that we'll never have any more diabetes, no cancer. We don't even need glasses in the new kingdom. We'll be able to have perfect sight and because Jesus will be the light of the world. And so if you want that, today is your chance to come to him and experience the life that God gives. Yes, Lord. We would pray. I pray that God, you would touch every viewer today and those that are watching this broadcast. Oh God would look at their lives and say, you know what? I want that kind of life. I see other people that have that joy. I see other Christians that, that, that have this peace that passes all understanding. They're always at peace. And so God, I want that peace. And so he's offering to you today. All you have to do is confess your sin to Christ find a church to go to so you can be fed in God's word. And so I'm praying right now that everyone under the sound of my voice will make a decision for Jesus Christ today. And if you've already made the decision, that you would recommit and go to a whole new level of faith and let God do more than he's ever done in the past. And we count this all done in Jesus' name. Thank you, my brother Dale. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Michael. It's great seeing you. Yes. Oh, boy. Pastor Michael Hatch is my favorite guest. <laughs> and he's been on once again. And uh, believe me, Michael, I think there are still some more problems in the world. So I'll be checking in with you again. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. I love to talk about the, the things that are going on because I believe Christ can fix them all. But we have to identify oh, them and recognize them first. So, yes. Thank you once God again, Dale. It's always a pleasure. God bless you. Thank you, Michael. And we'll see you again soon. God bless you. Thank Look you all for to watching. Thank, Thank you. you all for 
enjoying this little experiment of ours. In your son Jesus' name, we pray for you. And as I try to remember each and every show, please walk with him. God bless you. watching Las Vegas Tonight with your host, Dale Davidson. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of our show. We so appreciate your loyalty to our program. To keep Las Vegas Tonight on the air, please go to our website, vegasaints.org, and click the Donate button. To send a check or money order, please make it out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries and mail it to 9030 West Sahara Avenue, Suite 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. What affects your credit? The answer can be many things. Let's take a look at a few of the most common factors and how they can impact your credit. Credit history. In order to have a credit score, you need to have open and active credit accounts. This gives you the opportunity to build a credit score and get approved for larger purchases such as a car or a home. So it's important to have a responsible record of debt repayment. Available credit and usage. The rule of thumb is to use 30% of your available credit to minimize the impact of debt on your credit score. In other words, the less credit you use, the better. Monthly on-time payments. By making sure your monthly payments are paid on time, you could boost your credit score. Late payments, however, may bring your score down. Errors on your credit report. Check your credit report regularly to make sure it's accurate. If there are any errors or signs of identity theft, report them immediately to the appropriate credit bureau. Applications for credit. If you're applying for credit, filling out several applications in a short amount of time may hurt your credit score. It's ideal to keep the applications to a minimum. However, there is an allowable shopping window for a mortgage. Remember, a good credit score could possibly save you in interest payments. If your credit score needs some improvement, however, consider starting with the basics mentioned here. And when you're ready to buy your dream home, give New American Funding a call. We'll help you find a home loan that works for you and your unique situation. I can already feel you judging me, and not for what I've done in the past, but for what I'm about to do. I had what mattered, and I, uh, I got, I got careless. Like, I don't deserve more. I don't deserve sympathy. I, I don't deserve to be here. What is the matter with you? Someone once told me, you may not be everybody's cup of tea, but you're somebody's shot of whiskey. Excuse me. Ma'am, my, my car ran out of gas and I left my wallet at home. Could you please spare a couple dollars so I can refuel my vehicle? I literally have nothing. What's it gonna take? get you to join a program. Get back, dog! If Jesus wanted you to have a dog, he would have blessed you with a bowl of leech now, wouldn't he? Traditional TV is going away. Hollywood is starting to fade. 
People are demanding real stories from real people. Our voices are now being heard in our own way. Podcasts, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok Live are becoming the norm. Internet TV has now reached the highest demand in human history. Social media shows is now the new media of the century.